So, in this video, I would like to uh, continue to explore uh, these issues of masculinity and about of growing up that we have been looking at in several of the poems before. In masculinity, I'm thinking particularly about things like uh, inheritance, for example, um, but also, uh, particularly on the growing up side of things, you'll be thinking about things like father, um, like, for example, a border country will come into it, uh, and various things like that. Um, obviously, a number of other poems as well. Um, a few brief notes then before we begin. Um, first of all, I would describe really both these poems in a sense as being two vignettes is a, a nice term that we can use, two little sort of snapshots um, of rural life. First of all, um, a farrier being another name for a uh, blacksmith who shoes horses, um, as illustrated by that rather nice painting on the right, which I think rather captures the sort of slight romanticising of this profession that we see uh, in Shear's poem. Um, Late Spring is possibly one of the most peculiar poems in this collection, and possibly ever, um, because it uh, talks about the experience of castrating lambs um, with a, a pair of an in implement like a pair of pliers, which you can sort of see um, in, the, in the image there to the left. It's not a particularly pleasant poem, but again, it's all about rites of passage and growing up. So, let's move on then, and let's look at the poems. So, first of all, the farrier. Blessing himself with his apron, the leather black and tan of a rain-beaten bay, he pinches a roll up to his lips and waits, the smoke slow turning from his mouth, for the mare to be led from the field to the yard, and the wind twisting his sideburns in his fingers. She smells him as he passes, woodbine, metal and hoof, careful not to look her in the eye as he runs his hand the length of her neck, checking for dust on the lintels. Folding her back leg with one arm, he leans into her flank like a man putting his shoulder to a knackered car, catches the hoof between his knees as if it's just fallen from the table, cups her fetlock and bends, a romantic lead dropping to the lips of his lover. Then the close work begins, cutting moon silver clippings, excavating the arrowhead of her frog, filing at the sole and branding on a shoe in an apparition of smoke. Three nails gritted between his teeth, a seamstress pinning the dress of the bride. Placing his tools in their beds, he gives her a slap and watches her leave, awkward in her new shoes, walking on strange ground. The sound of his steel biting at her heels. And now, late spring. It made me feel like a man when I helped my grandfather castrate the early lambs, picking the hard orange o-rings from the plastic bag and stretching them across the made-to-purpose tool, heavy and steel-hard in the sun, while he turned one between his legs to play it like a cello. Spreading the pink, unwooled skin at their groins, he'd coax them up into the sack, one-handed, like a man milking two soaked beans into a delicate purse, while gesturing with his other for the tool, a pliers in reverse, which I'd pass to him, then stand and stare, as he let his clenched fist open to crown them. We did the tales too while we were there, so when I walked the field weeks later, both could be counted, the tales scattered like catkins among the windfall of our morning's work, a strange harvest of the seeds we'd sown. Now, let's begin then. The first thing I'd like to talk about with regard to the poem Farrier is the way that the horse is presented. If you look at the third to last stanza, the one that begins in an apparition of smoke, but that ends with this image, the dress of the bride, the horse then being personified, not merely as human, not merely as female, 
but a bride. Um, in the stanza two above that, it ends with that image of the horse as a lover. Um, a metaphor there, with in the same metaphor, the farrier being described as like a romantic lead, like the male actor, in other words, in a film or a play. Now, when I say here that this is a poem which romanticises this aspect of rural life, in this context I do mean romanticises with a small r, in the sense that it literally takes this, um, this sort of um, quite brutal process and seeks to give it a certain nobility and dignity. Um, but it is really quite bizarre, and if we actually follow it to its logical conclusion there's something bestially quite weird about this man with this oddly close relationship to the horse that he's shoeing um, which is probably best if we don't dwell on here um, I think perhaps that might be simply Shears the young poet um, with a sort of this kind of inadvertent associations that he gives us but nonetheless anyway let's begin much like in the steelworks, you have images that are almost religious about these kind of touchstone moments. In the case of the steelworks, he talks about the action of bending to lift something as being like a benediction, uh, like a blessing. And indeed here, this poem begins with this continuous phrase, blessing himself. And so we have this idea of the farrier who's being described, the man shoeing the horse, as some kind of saintly figure, some figure of awe, somebody iconic. Blessing himself with his apron, in other words the bend as he puts it over his head, the leather black and tan of a rain-beaten bay. Look at all the plosives there, blessing black beaten bay. This is a tough man that is being depicted here. A bay means, I believe, a brown horse. Um, so that um, is, is the sort of depiction there, but um, the sort of beautiful description of it that you have. Um, and if we're going to talk about the sort of hegemonic ma masculine portrayal of this farrier, then it, what could be more masculine then than smoking? The smoke slow turning from his mouth. This is somebody who is completely calm, completely comfortable in themselves. Even the smoke moves slowly in that verb there. Um, you know, this is not somebody who's panting or panicked, like the depiction of the old father puffing as he climbs the hill in the poem, Father. Um, this is somebody with complete self-assurance. For the mayor to be led from the field to the yard and the wind twisting his sideburns in its fingers. I mean, as a whole, I think Shears is not a, um, a poet given to particularly flowery imagery, but I think there is something that is particularly sort of monosyllabic about this poem. Um, you know, there's a real sort of earthy groundedness about this language. You know, these are good old English words. We're not talking about uh, anything that sounds fine and Latinate and elegant here. We talk about um, masculinity. Again, sideburns, the ability to grow facial hair is very much part of the sort of masculine ideal um, that's being built up here. The wind twisting his sideburns. How many times now have we talked about the wind as being a sort of symbol of adversity in Shears? And yet in this poem, this farrier seems at home with it. It's merely twisting his sideburns, almost as a gesture of affection, which I think perhaps tells us just how much Shears idealises people like this who fit in and who belong in a way that he doesn't. Remember, he was not born in Wales. It's somewhere that he came to quite late in his childhood at the age of nine. It's somewhere that he actually then left to find uh, education and work. So I think there's a sense, yes, where he idolises and admires people like this man. 
There's another point, actually, um, which I read somewhere about this poem, which is that in Wales, horse riding is considered to be a somewhat more democratic pastime, certainly in the countryside, than perhaps it is in England, where we tend to see it as being a little bit more of an aspirational thing. Um, and so there's a sense that this is not merely some kind of uh, middle-class individual, but we're, what we're seeing here is a genuine working-class man engaged in a timeless profession. And, of course, that's important as well, the idea of a timeless profession doing a job like this that is as old as time, almost. It's another link back into the past. The third stanza begins with this image of intimacy. She smells him, again linking to the idea of the bride, the lover, the intimacy and the closeness that we see here between them. She smells him as he passes Woodbine, Woodbine being an old-fashioned make of cigarettes. Um, I'm not even sure, actually, whether they're still sold. Um, but Woodbine, metal and hoof, this very simple sort of materials. Again, it's very sort of grounded. Um, but it, and we get a sense of his wisdom, careful not to look her in the eye as he runs his hand the length of her neck. Another image of intimacy there, I think, and checking the dust on the lintels. It's also been said, actually, um, with the, these poems, that they are, owe a debt in uh, elusive terms, in intertextual terms, they owe a debt to the uh, Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who you, you will know from Storm in the, on the Island um, at your GCSE, but who particularly in his early years wrote a great many poems not dissimilar to this, I, I, sort of capturing these moments of what he thought were sort of vanishing rural life. Um, there's an excellent poem, for example, called Digging. Um, but um, again, I think it's very much Shears tapping into these this sort of literary culture and saying, you know, I belong, I'm a part of this too. Um, it goes on then. Folding her back leg with one arm, he leans into her flank, like a man putting his shoulder to a knackered car, catches the hoof between his knees. Now, that simile about the knackered car is a strange one, and again, rather like the uh, wires that are described in the poem Swallows, it's interesting because it's a kind of, it's an image of the modern day, or at least the relatively modern day, that intrudes here. Uh, and it's a reminder that Shears is, after all, a contemporary poet. He's not simply somebody who is trying to ape or to imitate the images of times gone by. There's also something unsentimental and businesslike here, which sits awkwardly with a lot of the romanticised imagery that we've talked about. So, in a sense, it doesn't really quite fit that pattern. But the business-like element, again, I suppose it links to that. Like the idea of him not looking her in the eye, it's the kind of wisdom of his profession that he has. Um, we talked about casualness and the relaxedness. We talked about the slow-turning smoke, for example, on line four. And I think that is now developed because you have, for example, the simile about how when he catches the hoof between his knees... Um, to grip it to actually work on it it's described as being as if it's just fallen from a table that's the level of casualness here this is somebody who is completely at home once again with his job and with his environment it goes on then cups her fetlock i.e. holds the foot and bends or the ankle or something and bends a romantic lead dropping to the lips of his lover that's the image of the intimacy there that we talk as he bends down over this horse's foot. And if you look there, the fluid L sounds that um, um, that we uh, that we have at the end of that scene, sort of, there's a kind of slight uptick in intimacy. Um, you know, as I say, it's a strange poem. But the idealisation continues because then the close work begins cutting moon silver clippings now uh, or moon sliver clippings now that metaphor there these um bits of dirty horse toenail if you know the horse hoof um 
that are described as being something that is beautiful, precious and rare with that metaphor there. Um, and the emphasis on those C consonants, again, it's the delicacy of this man. It's interesting because if we're talking about a poem that presents an ideal of masculinity, then I suppose in a sense there is this tension between brutality and delicacy between the man who puts his shoulder to a knackered car and um, and a man who is capable of such beautiful, delicate work as that line describes. It goes on then, to add further detail, excavating the arrowhead of a frog, i.e. digging out bits of impacted dirt. Um, and again, if you think about that verb excavating, not simply digging out, in a sort of brutal and skillless way, but it's elevated to the level of something precise, like an archaeological excavation. There's a delicacy and a skill that's implied by that metaphor that the verb gives us. So, of a frog filing at the sole and branding on a shoe in an apparition of smoke. We talked a little bit in one of the earlier poems um, about, I think it was the equation, about the way in which Shears seems to uh, rather like these magical images. And there, the idea of an apparition of smoke, it seems like what we're watching here is a, a, a sort of conjuring trick, a magic trick taking place before our, our eyes. And I think that's deliberate too, um, because it, again, it links to the, uh, the sort of the, the ease and the relaxation of this man, that it seems as if what he is doing is... Uh, something that he's completely at home with, so much so that it looks almost magical. We continue on then. Three nails gritted between his teeth. Again, the toughness coming through. But juxtaposed directly with that, on the one hand you have that, but you also have the idea of the seamstress pinning the dress of the, the bride. And so it's a further extension. Yes, this is a hegemonic image of masculinity. Yes, toughness is part of it, but a delicacy and a sensitivity is part of it too. In a, in a way, what this most reminds us of is the final stanza of the poem, Inheritance, where she is having dissected the masculine influence of his father and the feminine influence of his mother, talks about how in a sense, those virtues are combined together. And I suppose that's what we're seeing here. There's a real similarity. Um, the brutality and the delicacy. Somebody who can put his shoulder to a knackered car, lean into a flank in that way, um, but at the same time can be capable of delicately excavating, or indeed with a metaphor like a seamstress, the idea of somebody a genuinely skilled sewing, the delicacy that we have there. And then the poem is sort of over, placing his tools in their beds. Again, there's a tenderness. These tools are personified as children. Um, del the delicacy and sensitivity that comes with his toughness. He gives her a slap and watches her leave. Um, so again, if we think about this as an animal, it's fairly straightforward. But again, it's, it's, it's odd in a sense because it's a, um, you know, in a sort of me too age, the idea of, Giving, giving, giving a woman slap and watch a slap and watching her leaves. It's odd the way that these sort of personifications bleed in and out of each other. It's the toughness that we have here, but awkward in her new shoes, walking on strange ground. In a way, it's almost a kind of rebirth that we're witnessing here, um, and I suppose that's an image that we see various times too. In the equation, you have the image of the egg in trees. You have the idea of the tree planting. And in a way here, what this farrier is giving is a new beginning to this mare. But the final image, the sound of his steel biting at her heels, it ends on this note of sort of harshness, um, which is rather strange. But here we have this poem. What else then is worth noting about it. Well, once again, the meter is irregular. It's written in these tercets, these three-line stanzas, um, which, interestingly enough, is um, 
a form that's particularly associated with the sort of tradition of um, Welsh poetry, particularly Welsh oral poetry. Um, but I think the effect is always one of a slight unevenness, of a slight arrhythmia, a slight lack of, uh, of, of regularity. And I think there's always an awkwardness here. And perhaps, in a sense, this, this, the subconsciousness here is perhaps this is a questioning of the idealization that's taking place. Shears can idealize this man because he seems to represent all the things that Shears admires the rootedness, the link with tradition, the groundedness in place, the toughness, the tenderness, and yet at the same time, perhaps we can argue that the tercet structure almost um, implies that this is a sort of slightly false impression, and particularly. The fact that he ends on that single line, the fact that the final tercet is not resolved from a line into a, th a sequence of three, again, leaves this poem just slightly uncomfortable, just slightly awkward. This is Shears admiring it, and yet at the same time being slightly aware that there is... Um, that, there, that there is a kind of a kind of challenge in it. Let's then move now on a little bit more quickly to late spring. Now, he's talking about when he was young, helping his grandfather in on this farm. Clearly, the fact that he begins with that simile, it made me feel like a man, is the important emphasis. Therefore, that he wasn't that he was a boy, but there's another aspect to that as well, which is that um, Shears the boy wanting to feel like a man, wanting to grow up, rather like the way that he was driving the cars, for example, in border country, the way that he was watching those buzzards, and yet, um, the perhaps rather like in that poem too, when at the end he still sees himself as a, or imagines himself as a boy, perhaps even now as an adult, he still is looking for this idea of wanting to feel like a man, wanting to feel that he matches, if you like, the ideal that we saw in the previous poem, Father. When I helped, uh, uh, the farrier rather, I beg your pardon. When I helped my grandfather, he goes on castrate the early lambs. Now, again, we are much in the sort of Seamus Heaney or the R.S. Thomas tradition, we are very much here in these unglamorous aspects of rural life. Uh, in that sense, in that in that in that sense at least, the, the the romantic elements that we talked about in Faria are more tempered in this poem. They're less apparent, um, and it's also curious because um, so much of the Shears poems that we've talked about are about new beginnings, like trees, like. Um, the farrier uh, and like uh, the equation but here what we find um, is that the, for, for these lambs their lives are mapped out for them they will not include reproduction they will simply be brought up to be killed so it's a reminder of mortality isn't it the poem's title is Late Spring. Now, spring as a whole is associated with birth and new beginnings. Um, that, therefore, I think, the fact that it's late spring, I think, can map across to the idea that presumably this is Shears in his late childhood. One assumes he wasn't there at the age of four, being muted, you know, being encouraged to help mutilate little cute sheep. But um, but there's a sense then of growing towards manhood. But of course, there's always the reminder that the seasons are cycles. And for all that summer might follow spring, autumn will follow summer. We grow up, we grow old, and then the inevitable happens. It's a reminder that he is in this cycle. And I suppose the fact that it's castrating, on the one hand, it gives them that sense of power. We've said for several of the other poems, particularly things like border country, particularly history, um, we said that they are reminders of um, man's insignificance in the face of nature. Now, we don't see that so much here, because really in this poem it's all about the superiority that they have over these lambs. 
and yet the ending is oddly uncomfortable. This strange harvest that he describes of the discarded testicles and tails of these um, of these lambs. It's a really oddly uh, uncomfortable image, um, and I suppose perhaps it suggests that there is something fundamentally odd about human humanity's uh, desire and will to play God, to um, to, imp to impinge on the natural cycles of birth and creation uh, in this way. At any rate, he carries on then with some quite precise details, picking the hard orange O-rings from the plastic bag um, and stretching across the made-to-purpose tool. So essentially what they do is they stretch these O-rings, like a big rubber band, over the testicles and then taking out the tool it closes to shut off the blood flow. That's what's been described there, but it's a very precise image again significantly vivid um and it shows in a sense i suppose that this is she is trying to i suppose in a way establish his rural credentials he's trying to suggest you know he's not a townsman writing about the country he's somebody who understands what this kind of life looks like um so the precise detail continues he describes this tool but look at how he describes it heavy and steel hard once again these are vivid tactile images he really wants us to share with him the experience that he had whilst um, whilst doing this and he now describes the grandfather dealing with this sheep again very similarly to the farrier the real elegant grace and the effortlessness with which he does it there's another sense in the same way that Shears idealises the uh, farrier, here he seemingly idealises his grandfather too. Because he describes turning one between his legs to play it like a cello. In other words, in the same way that in the previous poem he describes uh, him gripping the hoof between his knees, here now he has the whole sheet between his legs to hold it tight while they perform this operation. Um, and the image, like uh, the similarly like a cello, again, in the sense that this is a high art, this is something in its way just as noble as any piece of music, which I think relates back to, for example, in the poem um, um, uh, where, where he describes the picking of the um, blackberries in the poem Hedge School. Um, again, you have that sort of equation, the, this idea that the, the arts and the things that you find in the country are in their own way just as, uh, uh, just as wonderful as the, anything that civilization um, can present. I think we see that again here. So he now goes on to describe in really quite uncomfortable detail exactly what this involves even further spreading the pink unwooled skin at their groins he'd coax them up into the sack one-handed like a man milking two soaked beans with a delicate purse now this is a grotesque and a vile thing the idea that he is m moving the testicles away from the body so that he can make a clean cut through the scrotal sack is a vile thought and yet this idea of the simile here of the delicate purse Again, it's an idealisation of this process, even as he describes the brutality of it. That li but the, the delicacy of it links quite nicely back to things like the moon silver clippings of the farrier, for example. Um, it's a deeply, deeply unpleasant poem, quite frankly, and it's one I really don't like. Um, but it goes on, gesturing for his, with his other hand for the tool, appliers in reverse which I passed him and then stand and stare as he let his clenched fist open to crown them. Now to crown, I think, in this context, meaning to cut off. Um, now, the fact that Sh Shears uh, describes himself here standing and staring, I think reflects the outsider status that he's still um, battling against in a way here. He will never belong here in the way that this farrier will, in the way that his grandfather will. Um, he always labours under this sense of an outsider, and now doubly an outsider, because having come late to Wales, 
he has now left it again. Um, and so yeah, yeah, this image of Shears as the kind of voyeur, the outsider, is an interesting one. And actually it's one that we crop up with quite a lot, particularly in the relationships of the poems in this, in this collection as well. Um, but yes, interesting image. Shears the observer, Shears the voyeur. We go on then. We did the tales too while we were there. And that little ad uh, adverbial phrase, while we were there, that's so casual. Again, it links back to things like the image of the farrier with his roll-up um, and his slow-turning smoke um, and him catching the hoof as if it's just fallen from a table. Um, we... Um, we, you know, once again, we're looking at somebody who is completely at home in this environment. Um, and you have this really bizarre image, which uh, it seems almost incredible that it could be based on reality. This idea that they would simply leave everything there, um, and then that they would walk by weeks later and be able to see the cut-off tails and the cut-off testicles just seems quite extraordinary. It seems incredibly callous. Um, Unless, of course, perhaps the argument is that you leave it there for animals to feed on or something, or birds to feed on, but it's really sort of casual, uh, callous. But I suppose it reminds us of the harshness that is in, that it, that is in rural life once again. It's not, um, it's not like Marie Antoinette, for example, um, you know, before the French Revolution, having a model village built, paying peasants to live in it and look decorative. Um, dressing up as a milkmaid, for example, and having a special luxury milking parlour built. It's not that kind of the pastoral. It's not the kind of fanciful urban variety that Shears has. He's emphasising his, um, his connection to this working landscape. This is another poem written in the Tercets, but this time, interestingly enough, they are at least resolved. Um, although it's odd, because the resolution that the form... Um, has when it finishes I think in a strange way masks the irresolution of this ending he's left um, uh, finding it strange what he witnesses and I think that in this context the adjective strange carries a particularly deeply weighted sort of sense of meaning um, because it is profoundly strange the whole uh, uh, operation that we've seen is profoundly strange. It's an odd thing. But that, I think, is what we see here. The best that she is can hope to be like a man, to be standing and staring, to be looking on. The sense that Shears is the outsider who, in spite of all his attempts, in spite of his scholarship, in spite of all his knowledge, never will quite belong. He will look to a future in which he never quite belongs. He looks to a past, and even in the past here, doesn't quite belong alongside his grandfather, who seems so much a product of this landscape. Um, so once again, we're left with this idea of Shears, like the boy, um, somehow feeling out of place, looking for his way home, it says, at the end of, um, at the end of border country. Um, and there we have it here. Thank you very much once again for your attention, and we'll leave that there now.